Hello, everyone. This is Bridget Adewadie, a student journalist with T.C. William High School, The Ogany Newspaper. And welcome to another episode of Behind the Headlines. And here I am in my bedroom in front of my bookshelf because we're in the middle of a pandemic, but that's not stopping us from having our show. And on this episode, we're going to be talking about all things virtual, starting off with virtual journalism. During this time, a lot of local newspapers have been struggling to push out content and be able to sustain their business models. But I have three journalists with me today to talk about their experience. First, I have Denise Dunbar with the Alexandria Times. And then Michael Pope with the Virginia Public Radio. And Vernon Miles from Alex Now. <laughs> So first off, Denise, as a publisher of a local newspaper, what's it been like uh, being able to keep track of stories and put out an issue of the Alexandria Times every week? So um, I give our our core staff a whole lot of credit. Um, our editor, Missy Schrott, has just done a phenomenal job of um, figuring out processes and sort of keeping this all um, on track. and. Our graphic designer, um, basically from the start of this, we worked remotely except for Wednesday, which is our production day. And on that day only, we would come into the office with you know gloves and masks and uh, physically pass the pages around to do the proofreading. But a couple weeks in, um, you know, like one of the people had a low grade fever and you know, we weren't sure about what to do. And so we just made the decision to go completely virtual even with doing our production and doing our staff meetings and all of that. And um, I actually have a fun photo that I should share somewhere, you know, of all of us doing our staff meeting and our little Zoom, you know, cubes on the on the page. And, you know, what we've learned is um, I'm sure there there must be like a typo or two that are, are in there that, that wouldn't have been otherwise. But I really think the overall product um, that our team has been able to do is um, I don't really think that that has suffered. And in fact, in the middle of a crisis like this, I think is when um, a, a media company becomes more significant to the community and, and can make a real difference um, in, um, you know, in, in staying on top of and localizing this, this worldwide um, issue. And so that's what, what we've been trying to do. And for me personally, what has been a little bit of a fine line to walk is the um, the balance between being a journalist and covering it and adv advocacy, because I've actually been a little bit frustrated with our local government that they haven't up until now taken a more proactive role in sort of getting out of their normal operational silo and you know, actively working to get equipment, um, you know, get the PPE themselves, get the um, more testing. I mean, it really does seem like at both the state and local, um, you know, city level nationwide, um, the people who have been more proactive have gotten more of this stuff, have been able to test more widely, have been able to set up drive through testing stations. We're now do starting to do that in Alexandria, but in my opinion, we were three or four weeks a little bit behind the curve. And so anyway, um, it, it's been, a, and then we, we've launched our wear a mask, save a life, campaign at the Alexandria Times. Um, um, and again, we felt like that was something, it was basically, it's our own public service um, campaign that it was an area where we felt like we could make a difference by editorializing it, publicizing it. You know, we have a, a little contest every week if people can name, um, whoever names the most of the masked uh, city, city leaders, um, they get a restaurant gift card. And so, you know, we're trying to have a little fun with that aspect of it, as well as just sort of raise awareness and maybe maybe make somebody who was like, I'm not gonna wear a mask, but you know, then they see Justin Wilson or Amy Jackson or, you know, somebody that is prominent and well known wearing a mask, and then they're like, Well, maybe I will wear one. You, Michael, are a radio host and you're in broadcast, and obviously uh, that's a bit more difficult than being a publisher because you're actively gathering information and trying to interview people. What's it been like for you trying to you know, get your radio stories in and be a journalist during this time. Well, a couple of things on that. First of all, it's very difficult to be a newspaper publisher. I know I wouldn't want to try to do it. So hats off to Denise for making the Times the yeah. product that it That's is consistently week after week. 
uh, you know, one of the beauties of being on radio is that people don't know what a ramshackle operation it really is. Uh, so, in fact, this is the microphone that I use to, to go on the radio. Um, you know, the it's challenging, really challenging to be in an environment where you can't go out and talk to people and you can't go to the city council meeting and you can't go to the General Assembly. And, um, you know, the uh, this week, actually, the General Assembly is meeting in Richmond and they're doing all this wacky social distancing stuff like the House of Delegates is meeting outdoors in Capitol Square. Uh, the Senate is actually meeting in a museum appropriate for the Senate to meet in a museum. Right. Uh, but and under normal circumstances, I would be going down there to, you know, make to talk to them and observe what's going on. And uh, one of the beauties of going to events and covering events is you can talk to people before it starts and you can talk to people after it ends. And so those oftentimes are the most interesting, insightful conversations you have with people who are there before it starts and after it ends. Uh, you you miss all of that uh, when you, everything is virtual and you're not able to do that. And, you know, also just sort of being an extrovert. I hate being locked up in my house all the time, too. I mean, like being being a journalist is really a weird profession because you kind of have to walk the line between being an extrovert. In other words, talking to strangers is a very important part of the job. Uh, but then you've got a notebook full of stuff and you have to like sit down and write it all out. And that's sort of the introverted part of it. So the the extroverted part of me is missing out on going out and talking to people and being in the world. But, you know, that's that's the environment that we're in now. For you, Vernon, you're a part of this fairly new uh, online news platform called Alex Now. And what's it been like for you, you know, trying to get out stories when you're on strictly an online platform you have to get out advertisers and i'm sure you have a couple of the similar problems that michael has but what's it been like for you it's tough all across the board it's tough from the reporting side of i haven't set foot in alexandria in two months and so you know i have like you're writing about stuff entirely digitally entirely online it's you know i could be in Russia or Saudi Arabia right now, and it wouldn't make a difference in my reporting except for the time zones. Uh, so it's it's a real disconnect, and you feel isolated and broken apart. And at the same time, you're doing this constant, like, around the clock. I mean, we're doing up to dates at 10 o'clock at night when they post the new numbers for, like, the coronavirus victims. We're doing stories that come in, like, 15 minutes as they're, like, happening. Like, the, the protest was happening outside of uh, Southern Towers on Monday, April, whatever today is, 20th. And, you know, we're, we have to be there. We have to cover it somehow. So, like I said, we sent our uh, kind of more disposable uh, photographer who could be there to get the pictures. Uh, just kidding, Jay, if you're watching this. But it's, you know, it's, it's chaos. And it's struggling to find out how to do that on the reporting side. On the editorial side, in terms of, like, advertising that you mentioned with uh, people paying for ads, that's gone down a lot, too. So we have more traffic to our site than we've ever had, which, you know, we're... ALX now has only been around for a couple of months, so that's not saying a lot. But ARL now, our mothership, has been around for 10 years. And we're seeing more traffic there than we ever have. And yet the advertising is still going down because it's just not there. So like we've had across the board pay cuts, we've had stuff like that. And that's been, you know, it's it's tough. And you kind of wonder like how long something like that can hold out. Another area of chaos is probably the local government and them trying to manage everything online via Zoom and of course, all the public hearings are now call-in public hearings, uh, mm -hmm. budget hearings and budget updates are over Zoom and Microsoft Office and all these online platforms. And I think it's pretty interesting that um, how these city officials are handling all of this because Mark Jinks, the city manager a couple weeks ago, he said that he couldn't imagine going through this crisis 10 years ago, you know, with the... <sighs> technology that we have and everything. And I was wondering, uh, Michael, uh, what have you seen come out of this with the pandemic and the local government uh, proceeding with its budget and other plans? Clearly, people are trying to move into this online sphere. You can't meet in person, so you're going to have to do a, a Skype call or a Zoom call. And so, like, we've seen that increasingly be the case. You know, uh, government leaders have been very reticent to move into this sphere because sort of once you go there, it's difficult to pull back. And I think that we're going to see that moving into the future, assuming we ever get out of this pandemic, that uh, now the precedent is there that you can meet virtually. Um, 
And so, you know, the city council and the school board have already been conducting virtual meetings, but our state government has not, not yet anyway. And so they might end up doing that. But again, there's this reluctance. Once you go down that path, then uh, are you going to let people participate in public hearings virtually every time you have a public meeting? So these are things that, you know, will become a precedent and people not, now need to figure out how they want to go back to normal, whatever that means, whenever we're able to do that. I would still say on the city council side, there are restrictions on that. They they have legal restrictions for the city council on what they're allowed to cover virtually. Well, well but there, there's that's also squishy because the legal restriction is it has to be about the emergency. So, but you can, but then right. the emergency, the longer it goes on, the more things encompass that. So for example, the initially the emergency is a health emergency, right? Well, does the budget count as part of the emergency? Well, it does because you have the budget deadlines. As the as the pandemic rolls on into month two and month three, then you could say things like the uh, transportation projects are part of the emergency. So the, the longer the pandemic and the, the emergency goes on, the more things are justifiably about the emergency. So um, I would actually make the argument they're really not as restricted as you as as people think they might have been. As for other aspects of the local government, including being able to attend public hearings, I've heard um, from a couple of neighbors that being able to participate civically in their local government just isn't the same anymore. It's not the same experience. Uh, I don't think anybody wants to be a part of a three hour or four hour Zoom call uh, for a city budget meeting or a public hearing. And I want to see what you think about that, Denise. Uh, how do you think this pandemic is going to influence um, people's ability or des desire to participate in civic life? So we've heard from um, a number of people, particularly um, a number of the, the civic associations in the city that are very concerned about land use um, related decisions happening during the shutdown and um, uh, like it, it's sort of referring to what Michael said, technically none of those are supposed to be happening, but there are things that are happening that the, the, a lot of residents are still upset about. Um, for instance, there are processes that development pro projects have to go through that, you know, community meetings and things like that. Some of those, even though the planning commission is not meeting, recommending things to go to city council until at least June, a lot of these preliminary meetings are going ahead and taking place virtually, and people are complaining that um, uh, those meetings should not count. I mean, a lot of people feel like uh, the developers and, and to a certain extent city council views these as check the box kind of exercises anyway, and that seems even more so that they're allowed to be able to do this during this time. It also becomes, to be honest, a bit of a discriminatory issue because Elderly people um, are not as able to use this technology to be able to weigh in. And um, poorer people also often don't have access to this kind of thing. So you really exclude a lot of people in your city from being able to participate when you do it virtually. And even though I know the mayor and other people have cited that there's actually been more participation in some of these kind of things, I would hesitate because I am I can guarantee you it's not as diverse a participation as we would normally have. For, for example, on Denise's point, I know they're moving forward with accessory dwelling unit. Um, they're doing like a lot of public public meetings for that, which are something that's been pretty controversial in the past. And it's been a topic of a lot of discussion that I, I think she's right. Probably won't be as big of a focus when those meetings are entirely online and not in person. And another area of concern that leaves out a lot of people is the court system and the cops that are operating during this pandemic. And obviously the police serve a pretty essential role in enforcing social distancing restrictions and you know ensuring the public safety during a pandemic but there is the concern of civil, civil liberties also being threatened and uh, the right to a speedy trial since we're in the pandemic you can't really have a speedy trial when you have elderly people a part of the jury and you did a story on this michael and what were your findings when you were investigating the court system 
Well, people have a constitutional right to a speedy trial, which in Virginia means there's a five month window uh, between when you're uh, in indicted and when you stand trial. Uh, that's if you're in jail, it's, there's a five month window. Uh, if you're released, there's a nine month window. Uh, but regardless of, of the timing, uh, you you can't just uh, be incarcerated for indefinite periods of time. That's why you have a constitutional right to a speedy trial. Keep in mind, we're not talking about people who have been found guilty of crimes. We're talking about people who have been accused of crimes. And should they sit indefinitely in jail while this pandemic rolls on and our court system is closed? This is the tension that you now find playing out in courtrooms across Virginia is prosecutors want to use the pandemic as a way to uh, keep people in jails or at least push back their trials if they want to release them. Um, and so, but you also have these civil libertarian groups like the ACLU saying, you know, a constitutional right is a constitutional right and pandemic or not, you know, that is something that should not be abridged. Here's the problem. If you want to Im impanel a jury, you're not going to get a jury to the courthouse, right? No one is going to come to the courthouse under these circumstances, and and the court and the, no judge is calling jurors right now. So our court system is on hold indefinitely, and that is a problem with the constitutional right to speedy trial. And we haven't really seen a good resolution of this yet. There's one judge uh, in a different part of Virginia that has cited the pandemic as a legal excuse. To uh, that uh, to trump the right to a speedy trial, uh, but we haven't seen that happen here in Alexandria yet. Although our local prosecutor does believe he has the legal authority to uh, to to overlook a person's constitutional right to a speedy trial, we have not seen an Alexandria judge rule on that yet. I'm curious to see how that would play out. I would say that. The jails are a little more empty than they usually are. Uh, I was talking to Lawhorn the other day, and he said they've got a, a pretty low level of people in the jail right now. The police have also said that they've made, they've been trying to do non-arresting uh, ways of getting around some stuff. I am yet to see that kind of come across in some of the court documents. I was still reading through one where somebody was, or they like arrest records. I was still reading through one last week where somebody was arrested for like, marijuana possession, and I'm like, really? <laughs> You guys don't have better things to be doing right now than arresting people for marijuana possession. But, you know, so we'll see how that goes as things move on. I think right now everybody's still trying to figure that out. You know, the police and sheriff's department can say things at a top level. And I think it's still going to take a while for some of that to trickle down to the uh, patrol. Denise, what other implications might this conflict between the courts and the jails and in the justice system in general, what might be the future implications of that? And are we going to see a spike in... Uh, court referrals and uh, suing after this pandemic is over? I think it, uh, an, an interesting aspect of this is the, pe the prisoners who have been released, um, you know, in Alexandria and nationwide from this. And it's, again, sort of a short-term, long-term um, kind of situation that in the short term, it probably does make sense to release as many people as you can um, uh, you know, within reason to protect them and to protect the sort of whole prison population, um, you know, it, it, as far as our jails, our prisons, and the people who work in the correctional um, facilities. On the other hand, are we going to have a significant spike in the long term in the crime rate from um, putting people back on the streets who had been convicted of crimes and were in jail for a reason? Um, you know, I think it's it's a legitimate question to raise on both sides of that. Um, but I, I sort of, I think most people fall uh, as with this, as, as with the educational and the, you know, the, the implications for our economy long-term of all of this deficit spending. Um, you have to get through the crisis and then deal with the longer-term aspects of it, I think. I mean, it is important to point out that the people in jail have not been convicted of anything. They've been accused of right. something. So we're talking about incarcerating people indefinitely who have not been found guilty but have been accused. No, but the, and also in places, people are being turned out of their sentences early is what I'm, I'm referring to. There are people who have been convicted who um, are, are being – you're talking about the jails. I'm really talking more about prisons and correctional – facilities um, where people where there are convicted people who have are also being released like 
people who have served 90% of their sentences in some places and um, you there is a push who, to who let are, like, elderly people out and people who have served most of their time. And yes, this is part of the discussion right. also is is in the right. prison. But there's also That's a lot of thought that, that says too many people are being locked up right now. And this mass incarceration is sort of not necessarily the best thing financially yeah. or socially. Uh, and so, I mean, I, as this pandemic, this I, a lot of people think this pandemic has sort of ripped the lid off of that discussion in terms of mass incarceration and criminal justice reform efforts that are moving forward. Vernon was just talking about the, the arrest for low level amounts of marijuana. Well, that's actually the law will be changing on that July 1st. Right. Uh, so right. it's interesting that the, the police are still enforcing this old law that's going to cease to exist shortly. But it, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a difficult issue all the way around. It's no slam dunk. You know, back in the 90s, I was in Richmond working on, uh, sorry, my computer shaking here, working on welfare reform when one of the, um, the initiatives at that time was also um, abolishment of parole. And, you know, we're getting a little bit off topic, but like it or not, it dramatically reduced the crime rates in Virginia when that, that happened. And so... I think it's a it's a discussion that's worth having as a society. You know, there are trade offs involved in it with everything, and you know, I think we're probably due for another discussion of all that. But we have to also acknowledge that the the negative aspect of if we go down that path of um, either making it stricter with incarceration or or um, you know or being more lenient. I think that's actually a really interesting preview to the General Assembly session 2021, when yeah. I can guarantee you parole will be at the top of the agenda, and that will be the sort of big discussion for 2021. I'm hoping Right to Work comes up for that, too, because I think you're seeing a lot of the interesting discussion about uh, service industry people who've been laid off and who you know find themselves laid off without any kind of collective bargaining power. So I think it'll be interesting to see if that kind of changes the tenor of discussion when it comes up to the General Assembly next year. Right. And there are a lot of unknowns involved in this pandemic with the court system and the city government and the future of local journalism. And I want to thank all three of you for taking time out of your quarantine to do this episode <laughs> with me. I'm Bridget, <laughs> I'm Bridget and these are my desks, uh, Denise, Michael and Vernon. And you've seen another episode of Behind the Headlines Home Edition.